Glad to know you stay with us. Professor Andre Ru, economist, University of Stellenbosch Business School, joins me for more on this. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining me today. Thank you. Good morning to you and your viewers. Yeah, good morning to you too. Now, Tito Mboweni, former South African Reserve Bank Governor, Minister of Finance and Minister of Labor, was one of the country's most consequential economic policymakers who drove several significant economic reforms. Do you share the same sentiment about him? I mean, there have been some amazing things being said about him. Yes, I do. Um, and, and, and of course, you'll be sorely missed, and my condolences to his family, friends, and comrades. The first time we became aware of Mr. Mbaweni, and of course, we must cast our minds back to those days where uh, the, the, the ANC was banned, those first few years following the unbanning of the ANC, and then the release of Mr. Nelson Mandela, we became aware of him, along with Trevor Manuel, another well-known name, when they were participants in something called the Montfleur Scenarios. And this was a set of scenarios around about the late 80s, early 90s, where influential people at the time, young people at the time, got together and looked at the possible outcomes of the, what was going to become democracy for South Africa. And many would argue that he, amongst others, were very well informed about the reality that lay ahead, and it might have changed in some ways the economic ideologies. Of course, when we did have our first true democracy, Mr. Bowenie was a minister, appointed Minister of Labour for a good four or five years, and he made some major changes to legislation aimed at protecting what up until then had been, let's be honest, a very exploited labour force whole range of labor laws and legislation was introduced under his stewardship. Meanwhile, uh, post-94, at the Reserve Bank, someone called Dr. Chris Stoss was reappointed by uh, the president, Mr. Mandela, to remain governor up until 1999. In around about 98, almost unexpectedly, it was announced that when Mr. Stoss or Dr. Stoss was going to retire, Mr. Mbaweni will take over as an ex-governor. And this is, the, the announcement was made about a year in advance. And for about a year, he kind of shadowed the governor. But at the time, I recall vividly, there was concern. Because, first of all, a politician being made a governor of the Reserve Bank could be potentially problematic. You know, might not, might not be, or might be, un, might be biased. And secondly, a politician who up to then had made his name as a Labour minister. It was concerned that under this new stewardship governorship, our monetary policy might go haywire. Of course, there was everything but that. He continued with the foundation laid by his predecessor. I think, as you pointed out in the introduction, he introduced inflation targeting, committed to maintaining the, 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 the holiness almost of the constitution, the constitutional mandate which tells what the Reserve Bank may or may not do. And although the political pressure and, and temptation might have been to relax monetary policy and grow the economy, he stuck to his guns. He stuck to the mandate of Reserve Bank to keep inflation under control, which turned out to be between 3 and 6%. If I ever look at a graph of inflation in those days, it certainly did remain on average below 5% or around about 5%. Interest rates remained above that, and I'll stop. I'll stop talking in a minute. <laughs> also, bear in mind that there were two other M's that played a role there: Finance Minister Manuel and President Mbeki. So we saw inflation falling, we saw government debt plummeting to new lows, and we saw decent economic growth. Quite impressive, if you ask me. I mean, talking about even transparency, televising the monetary policy meetings and all of those, he also started that. Now, as the first minister of labor in the New Democratic South Africa, he took several steps to improve the relationship, whether between business and, of course, labor. Now, among these were major legislative reforms, including the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, Labor Relations Act, Mines Health uh, Safety Act, and the NEDLAC Act, which was, of course, designed to improve cooperation between different constituencies, labor, business, and government. I'd like you to talk to us about these changes and what they represent in South Africa today. Mm. Yeah, always a controversial and subjective issue when it comes to labor in general, unemployment and labor laws. Many would argue that these laws are too constrictive and make it more difficult to employ somebody. 
But I think the counter argument is that prior to introducing these laws, laws protecting especially black labor were virtually non-existent. So for a good almost 80 years, go back to the 1920s, there were virtually no laws governing how black workers should be treated or should not be treated. And, and so when these laws were introduced, they came out of almost nowhere and appeared to be very dramatic and very drastic. They probably not much different to what you would have found in most parts of the world, but they came so suddenly and, 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 and all in one go that it created the impression of being very constrictive. Obviously, we fast forward 30 years, uh, they still play a role, one would argue, a role in the country's high unemployment rate. I do not think they play a major role or a dominating role. There are other reasons for unemployment, which are more structural, things such as education, training, and the like. But certainly, it is argued in some circles that if labor laws were to be a bit more relaxed today, it might make labor more attractive as a production factor. But again, I want you to think about the context of mid-1990s, after years and years of virtually no protection, uh, it was necessary to bring in laws and legislation and ways of protecting uh, the job tenure, the job conditions, working conditions of especially black, unskilled labor. So I think it was the right thing at the right time, uh, and perhaps not as drastic as one might have thought, but 30 years later, perhaps not having had the desired effect. Right. Now, let's also look at some of the other things they did. I mean, I just want us to take a look at all of those things and see where we stand with them in today's South Africa. Now, he also made three consequential decisions in South Africa's economic you know, policy trajectory. The first was the decision in 2019 to freeze government wages from 2020. You might also want to add to that the you know, famous Tito paper, unofficially known as Tito paper. Talk to us about this and the other decisions he sort of made at the time and you know, maybe some of the issues that arose as a result of these. Hmm. Yes, well, naturally, as you quite rightly suggesting, he re-emerged in politics as Minister of Finance. And uh, as is his nature, very exuberant, so often controversial, uh, but he stuck to his guns. And he recognized the fact that whereas back in 2008, government debt was at an exceptionally low level, 27%. When he resumed the, the, the ministership of finance, he inherited, as it were, a government debt rushing towards 65 70%. And further analysis showed that one of the reasons for that had been over the previous roughly nine years, after around about 2009, one of the reasons was the rapid increase in the number of civil servants and also very, uh, very, I suppose, generous wage increases discovering that close to, uh, government wage was close to 15% of the GDP. And he pointed out that pure maths, if nothing else, indicated that we wanted to really start getting some handle of controlling government debt that would imply, require, amongst other things, a wage freeze, as it were, on the government's wage bill. Naturally, uh, in many circles, that went down like a ton of lead and uh, it, it, it created the potential for large-scale, I suppose, almost rebellion. So we haven't quite seen a wage freeze, but he and subsequent minister have repeated the fact that we really want to reduce debt, reduce the interest burden on that debt, and free up resources for other areas of spending. The government wage bill is simply too high. So you're speaking there as a finance minister, I think very bravely, bearing in mind that my finance minister is also a politician, very bravely also uh, making these kind of statements. Uh, so towards the end of his tenure, he wasn't the most popular person in all circles, certainly not in the labor movement, uh, which he had represented 20 years earlier so handsomely. But it is what it is, and we're still wrestling with that high level of government debt, along with low economic growth and the well-known list of problems. Well, let's close on this. Can you think of any other economic policymaker who has left such an enduring legacy? Well, I suppose there have been. I mean, Trevor Manuel, 
uh, still uh, uh, known as a min at one time the longest serving finance minister. I think he's left a legacy in terms of, of, of fiscal policy. Um, Tito Mbweni, his legacy, I think, will live for a long, long time. I want to stress, not always necessarily uh, with fondness by all members of society, for the reasons I've just mentioned. Also, I think what's interesting, uh, the, the fact that in the midst of the growing sense of state capture and corruption, that the Reserve Bank, both under his leadership and today, to this day, has of all our democratic institutions, probably stood tallest in abiding by the Constitution, by not allowing its, its operations to be influenced by outside parties, which could include presidents and prime ministers. It's interesting that, as I say, they stood tall. I think also to the to the credit of the central bank, both today and in his time, and even the few years before that, we have had leadership at the central bank, including Mr. Mbaweni and his successors, who are well well versed in good old fashioned economics. They haven't been political appointees, as it were. By the way, Mr. Mbaweni did acquire masters in economics at a university in England, whose name just eludes me for a minute. So he wasn't just a pure political appointment, although he was and remained a politician. So I think that legacy and the memory of him and his personality and his exuberance and his joviality will, live, will, will remain for a long, long time. But also bear in mind, amidst all this joviality and exuberance, he had a very sharp mind. Uh, he, he, he knew what, what the right things were that he needed to be doing, and he stuck to his guns almost stubbornly, with, with, with a thick skin. And he was one of the biggest critics of so-called state capture and corruption, etc. I think that legacy alone is something that many politicians could and should aspire to. Right, thank you so much, Professor Andrea Ru, Economist, University of Stellenbosch Business School, for your time and your thoughts talking about T2 today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It. Pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.